Well, this is our final week of our series called Wolf Proof. And the series was birth um, out of the Lord just downloading stuff in me and telling me he wanted me to teach on it, but I was afraid to teach on it. And I just got to where I was just being straight rebellious and said, no, I want to do something else. I want to do something else. But I didn't realize that God wanted the wolves out of this house because he wants to come and do what he done today. And the Lord, I'm going to tell you this. I hadn't told y'all in any of these messages, but I'm about to tell you right now. You want to know the real reason why I'm teaching you this? You do? Well, let me tell you. Because I fear the Lord. And he told me this. He says, Jason, if you don't do it, I'll remove you and put somebody else that will. And I ain't going nowhere. I will be obedient. And I will fear the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You must increase. All of you, Lord, and none of me. In Jesus' name. So this is our final week. It was a five-week series. If you've missed any of them, I encourage you to go to our YouTube page. We have a phenomenal team of people led by Tim. What a blessing you are, brother. That countless hours to put that stuff together. To me, I just think it's one click of the button and it goes up there. No, he had to spend a lot of time on it. And he's a gift to the body. And let me just say this to you, Tim. I hear the Lord speaking to me. I don't know your name, sir. What's your name? Ralph is here today because you put those messages online. First thing he said to me, we've been watching you on YouTube, brother. That's what he said. Thank God for you, Tim. He must be glorified. So we're in our final week. Um, the series in a nutshell, let me give you a synopsis of it. God told me he wanted his kingdom to be established and there would be five levels of it. The first level, he wanted his government or his divine order. See, the problem is many of the houses around here that has the Lord on it, they're out of order. And God wants his government to reign. Then when his government reigns, his glory comes. Many people want the glory without the order, but it doesn't go that way. We must come in order. That's why when we start the service off, we get in line. I want his glory. Why do we want his glory? For the third level, so we can get the gold. The gold is symbolic for the oil. The color of the oil is golden, and the oil is for the glory, to pour it on him. And last week, we learned about the growth. He wants growth in his kingdom. And we see it. We see when his government's established and the glory came and he was anointed, expansion happened. Growth. And each week, we talked about one of those levels in a spirit that comes against it. We've talked about the Jezebel spirit how it tries to come against God's divine authority. We've talked about the spirit of Lucifer that comes against the glory, wants it for himself. Then we talked last week. Who remembers what it was last week? Who was listening? Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss one? Yeah, I did, sorry. I'm up here, the Lord's just firing stuff off in my head, so have grace with me. We talked about the Judas spirit with the gold. Judas wants the gold. So much so that he'll betray even Jesus to get it. Then we talked about the growth, the Absalom spirit. So Absalom, in my opinion, is probably the most dangerous one of them all. Why? Because it involves leaders. Judas is not that strong. He'll hang himself every time. Jezebel tries to act strong. 
But Absalom, we talked last week, he's secret. And he tries to get influence to destroy the growth in the church. And then, so what are we going to talk about this week? Well, that's the last one, and it's the greatness. And the greatness. Before I get to my first point, my first point is going to be what is the greatness. Before I get there, I feel so strong. Um, the Lord spoke this to me before I got started and said, Jason, I want you to read 2 Timothy 3.16 to them. It's not on the screen. Um, uh, somebody pull your Bible up. See, this is why you should bring your Bible to church. I may dag and pop a trivia question on you right here. First one there, say, got it. Read it loud. Loud. Yes, 316. Uh oh. You mean to tell me it didn't say in there it was supposed to be entertaining? Did it say it had a 30 minute time limit? Read it again, Jeremy. I think it did. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. I'm here for one reason only. I'm a gift from Jesus to you. To teach you his word. To love you. To care for you when you're broken. To put my big old arms around you and tell you we're here for you. But I'm also here for you when you get complacent to push you, to bring correction to you. Because I love you. So everything that I have shared and I will continue to share is not for your entertainment. It is to teach you so that you can grow, even if it brings correction to you, but it must be done in righteousness. I've done got 15, 16 text messages, private Facebook messages. Well, pastor, I think you're secretly, you know, you're abusing from the pulpit. Let me tell you something. I'm preaching the word. If it offends you, maybe you should ask God, why is this offensive to me? Because the, let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus says, I come to offend. You know what blew my mind? He says, I come to set a father up against his son. That don't make no sense, does it? Me and Miss Thelma had a good conversation about that, didn't we? Because some of us elevate our father and mother above the Lord. And he says, I'm going to set you up against each other because nothing will be higher than me. Praise the Lord. So my first point is this. What is the greatness? I got two definitions for you. The first one's not going to be on the screen. The second one will. The first definition, when you see the word great or greatness in Scripture, most of the time, not always, you'll see glory in front of it. Because greatness is a description of the glory, of what it looks like and how it acts. Has anybody ever heard, I know you've heard this about Lex, that's a great man of God. Why do we say that? Why do we look at count and say, you're a great man? That word great is describing something. What does it mean? I was absolutely floored 
when I looked this up and found out what it means. And let me say this. Here's some of the, uh, the riffraff I've been getting back. Pastor, I looked these words up and it don't mean what you say. Can I encourage you with something? You can't go on the blue letter Bible on a free app and get the full definition. It's just going to give you a thousand foot view. Let me give you an example. He, they're not, there's more than one interpretation and it takes a collective group to come together to explain it. So if I ask you, DJ, watch, I'm going to show you something. Stand up. Come right here, young lady. Stand up. Watch this. Turn around. One word, DJ. Only one word. I want you to explain what a cat is. One word. What is it? A cat. What is it? All right, give me another word for it. Meow. One word. An animal. Okay, have a seat. Somebody else, Charles. One word. Whiskers. A pet. A feline, right? So if I walked up and said, meow. Yeah, right? You may not get the full understanding of what it means. So you've got to dig. You've got to find the whole circumference of it in the context. To understand it wasn't just a cat, but it was a pet. And pets mean more than just a cat. Right? To the pet owners in here, right? So if you don't understand or see it how I see it, just come to me instead of sending me some hate mail. And I'll bring you over to my house. I'll feed you an incredible dinner. And I'll show you the software. And I'll let you look for yourself. But here's another thing. I could be wrong. And I pray you have grace with me. And if I am wrong, I'll stand up here and I'll repent. I'll do it. But I do my very best to spend countless hours to make sure that I'm giving you the truth. Amen? So with that being said, who wants to know what greatness means in the Hebrew? You ready? Pull it up. It's a territory, a region, a district. Look, a land region as a governmental administration area. A smaller unit of the whole nation, an embassy, and the number seven is associated with it. Now, we're going to we, we have a great time today. I want you to know that God's kingdom is great. How, who can tell me how a king measures his greatness? with his territory and how powerful he is, right? You can look all through the book of Kings and Chronicles and it talks about kings and how great they were with how much territory they took. I want you to know that he wants his kingdom to be great. It already is great, but he wants it to be great here. So what does that mean? He wants this to be his territory. He wants this to be an embassy. So we learned that his divine order came. We also learned then the glory showed up. So we can pour our gold on him. Then the growth happens. And once these four things happen, the greatness will be established. His embassy. You ever wonder why the Apostle Paul calls us ambassadors? Who's in charge of the embassy? The ambassador. Where are the embassies at? In other countries. What do they represent? They're a small piece or a small unit of the whole nation. So the United States has an embassy in other countries and they say 
this is our territory. And it's the greatness of our country over there. And an ambassador has been empowered by that nation or that kingdom to speak on behalf of it. it oh, you missed that one. Well, let me say it to you differently. What I'm saying is this, is that Dan, every time Satan comes to take authority from you, you have the power of the kingdom to say no. Because we speak on behalf of the king because we are his ambassadors. You can prove it to you? Pull it up. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Watch this. This is powerful. One of my favorite verses. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Oh, yes. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God mm -hmm. who brought us back to himself through Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation Listen. so we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us we speak for Christ when we plead come back to God so what should I be saying as an ambassador come back to the father we should have one mission, reconciliation. We speak on behalf of the king and the king is saying, come home. Repent and be reconciled back to him. I'm going to show you another verse. I love this. I added this in here because it has the word glory and great in it. But it's, it's Paul. He's still talking about the kingdom. Uh, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living yes. and sinful pleasures. Please listen. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God there and Savior, is. Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Yes. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. Totally committed to doing good works. Verse 12, and we are instructed to turn from godless living. Instructed. Now, some of you may say, Pastor, I don't do well with the instructions. I throw them away when I get something out. How many men's in the room like that? We don't do the instructions. We just figure it out. I do it, and I done it Christmas, and let me tell you something. I don't know if it was Gigi or Old Joy, but they bought my kids one of those whole uh, kitchen sets. Man, it was 100,000 pieces in that thing. I looked at it and I said, man, this ain't nothing. You know, it's, it's 1130 at night, Booker. I'm ready to go to bed. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sitting here putting this thing together and my dad's in there with me. And listen to me, my dad's a pretty clever guy, but when he starts doing this, <laughs> and my brother was helping me, and here's what ended up happening. I'm going to bed, man. I ain't worried about this thing. I get that sucker about put completely together and there's one peace in the wrong place and the whole thing won't work I had to tear it all down and then use instructions I ain't lying baby look you, you're right okay for the love of God you're right yeah sometimes me you just gotta take it she's right yeah we just going to have to humble ourselves, Count. Women know better sometimes. Men, listen to your wives. They're gifts from God. Yeah, just swallow your pride and say, yes, dear. Bring us back, Lord. 
So what are our instructions? If Titus tells it, and this is the apostle Paul talking to Titus, where are the instructions? Joshua 1 8. Pull it up, please. Study this book of what? Continually. Do what? Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything in it. Only then you'll be prosperous and successful. So, what is the book of instructions? The book for me. Look at the children's pastor over there singing. The Bible. You know, I was taught in children's ministry, Bible, basics, instructions for leaving earth. It's a book of instructions. It's to instruct you on how to live. Read them. Meditate on it. You know how you meditate on it? It's constantly going in. Constantly going in you. You know, they did a uh, recent study. Um, I was watching a John Bevere video, and they, John Bevere was interviewing a guy. If you don't know who John Bevere is, you, you're really missing out. Um, we'll introduce him to you. Um, but he was doing a study with a guy on um, <clears throat> basically how people engage with the Bible. How many people read the Bible, they engage with it, and also the effects of it. Some of the stats are staggering. Some of them are incredible. You want to hear them? Good, because I got them. So they, did, they took 40,000 people from the age of 8 years old all the way up to 80 years old. And they did a study on how people engage with the Bible and the effects it, it, it had on them in their relationships with anything. So the person that reads or hears the Bible one time a week, maybe you just come to church on Sunday and this is the only time you hear it, it had no effect in your life. So see, Sunday morning ain't enough. The person that heard or read the Bible two times a week, guess what happened then? Had no effect. Now, the person that read or heard the Bible three times a week, they started being able to chart it. They were seeing some small things with people. Things were starting to happen. When someone read the Bible or heard the Bible four times or more in the week, they said it spiked off the charts. Here's some of the stats. They said people that felt lonely dropped 30%. People that had anger issues went down 32%. People that had bitterness in a relationship, whether it's marriage with your child or somebody like that, it went down 40%. Alcoholism dropped 57%. That's powerful. Feeling spiritually stagnant. Who ever felt spiritually stagnant? You just, I just feel stagnant. When you read your Bible four times or more a week, that drops 60%. So if you're spiritually stagnant right now, read your word. <laughs> Look at this one. Viewing pornography drops 61%. When people read their Bible four or more times, there's some positive, more positive sides. I want to share two things with you on a positive note. People, they asked when they read the Bible four times a week, when it comes to sharing their faith, it went up 200%. People got confident and bold and said, I got to tell you about this Jesus I'm reading about. When people asked how they dealt with discipling other people when they read their Bible more than four times a week, it went up 230%. There's something powerful about reading the book of instructions. It's his greatness he's wanting to establish in you. It's the rules of the kingdom. Can I just say this just straightforward but with love? Read your Bible. Don't just pick it up and look at it. 
If you don't know how to read well or comprehend well, listen to it. If you have a hard time even listening to it, I promise you, there is somebody in here will take time out of their day every day and do a devotion with you. Yeah, especially my brother in the back. He loves it. <laughs> he back there raise his hand. I'll do it. <laughs> Which is a solid choice, by the way. But I'm serious. If you're that person, don't be embarrassed. Listen to me. Hear it from me. I've shared some of my testimony many times how I'm afraid to read out loud because of something that happened to me in school when I was young. So you know what I do? I listen to the Bible. I got an app that I listen to, and that's how the Lord speaks to me. I'll read it sometimes, but I, I learn when I hear it. And that's okay. We're here for you. We'll help you. We'll disciple you through that. Amen? But I want you to know something. Uh, the verse I read in Titus. Um, but when we don't read God's Word, when we don't read it four or more times a week, what happens? Well, when we don't wash ourselves with the Word, because that's what we do is wash it, we get dirty. We get dirty and we get unclean. And we become stagnant, full of bitterness, anger, and we open the door for division. You want to know why so many churches split? Because there's division. There's more than one vision in the house. There's God's vision, your vision, how you think it should run, how you think it should run, how you think the pastor should preach. There's multi-vision which causes division. It's because we're not reading our word and meditating on it. And we grow stagnant. And then we rely on human wisdom to make decisions. You know what I found interesting? The Apostle Paul in Corinthians chapter 1, the first chapter, he's encouraging them. And you know what the very first thing he has to deal with is? Let's read it. Look at this. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look here. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. How are we going to do that? When we all read this book in one mind and we have its purpose. The problem is many of us just scan through it real quick one or two days a week and we think we understand it and we don't. We all should be reading his word. We all should be on the same page. We all should be in one mind with one purpose. How many wants to know what that purpose is? Well, you know what? It's one word. Jesus. That's it. We don't need to be in the same mind frame about having a 10,000 member church. We don't need to be in the mind frame about having $50,000 saved up in the bank account. How long the service should be. One mind, Jesus. That's it. That's it. You, you, you know what the only thing that should be said every Sunday in his house? Jesus. How was church today? Jesus. What happened today? Jesus. How many people were there? Jesus. What did the pastor preach on? Jesus. Y'all getting it? Did you experience anything while you were there? Yes. Jesus. That's it. I bet you there'll be no divisions in the house. So what happens when we don't say Jesus, when we don't get Jesus in us, when we're overwhelmed with bitterness, when God cannot establish his territory and his greatness in here and division is open, what happens? Well, that's my second point. The Hippophel spirit comes. 
the Ahipophel spirit comes. Now, some of you may be saying, what on earth is that name? Well, if you read last week, I talked about Absalom. Ahipophel is all in it with him. So let me tell you who Ahipophel, the spirit is. The Ahipophel spirit is very important. You listen, because this one's this is a good one. Y'all need to pay attention to. The Ahipophel spirit attacks sub leaders. Okay, let me explain to you what I mean. So in this house, I'm the pastor. I'm the leader, but we have other leaders that serve here, up under this leadership. Those are sub leaders. You have people that are over different ministries. You have people like Tracy and Tiffany who are on our financial team. They're the leaders of that. Okay, you have people like Dallas who's over the order of the service. We got several people. Tim, who's over the media and production team. People like Miss Leela and uh, Mercy, who are over our old folks group, right? I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Yeah. I knew I was going to get something there. I love y'all. I do. But those are the sub leaders, and this spirit comes to attack them. Why? Because they got the influence. Can I tell you something that I've learned? By the time one of these spirits are exposed and I can see it to deal with it, it's already infected half the room. And it went through the leaders. And it attacks sub leaders or people of influence, how does it attack them and why? Who's been wounded or hurt or offended by the leader? Sometimes, and I'm not proud of it, I may say something hurtful or offensive to one of the leaders. And I have no intent to hurt them. It's my human nature sometimes. I don't suppress it and boom, I'll fly off and say something or I'll make a decision that they didn't agree with or whatever. It's just, it's just the nature of it. And there's an opportunity to get wounded and offended. And unfortunately, sometimes we accept that. Listen, I have had this spirit on me when I served another pastor. My pastor had done something that I've been working on for a long time building, and he just come in there and said, we're not going to do that, blah, blah, blah. I took it as he didn't value my time, and he didn't trust me. So I'm going to be offended. So let me tell you who Ahipophel is in the Bible. Ahipophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. Who is Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the woman that was on top of the roof taking a bath and David saw her, King David, and said, boy, that girl looked good right there. I think I'll have her. Now, here's the problem with it. The problem is, is she was a married woman to one of David, King David's best friends. This is going to get good. And he has this woman come and he sleeps with her and gets her pregnant. And you know where his best friend's at? He's not home. He's at war fighting to make David's kingdom great. And Ahipophel is the chief counsel to David. So I want you to imagine you're responsible for giving wisdom and counsel to the king and you watch him defy your granddaughter. Who'd be upset at that? Can I be honest with you? I would too. I, I feel it's just. It's a natural thing to experience that. Let me also say something I believe is going to set some people free. Do you know you can be angry and not sin? You know that? Now, everybody in the room may have their own interpretation of it. 
But let me give you just a brief interpretation of it. Jesus braided a whip, beat folks with that whip, flipped tables, and ran folks out of a church. And it says he was angry and sinned not. When it's justified, but when it's meant for hate and hurt, then it's, you've, you've acted on your anger and it's a sin. But when it's for the kingdom, say. And let me tell you what happens here. I want you to pay attention to this. Okay, I want you to see what happens. In 2 Samuel 15, we're going to read a few verses. This is where you're going to see Ahipophel come in right here. And look who he's going to associate with. 7 through 12. After four years, Absalom said to the king, mm. Let me go to Hebron to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill a vow I made to him. For while your servant was at Geshur in Aram, I promised a sacrifice to the Lord in Hebron if he would bring me back to Jerusalem. All right, the king told him, go and fulfill your vow. So Absalom went to Hebron. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. His daddy. As soon as you yeah. hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. Mm -hmm. He took 200 men from Jerusalem with him as guests, but they knew nothing of his intentions. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, he is. one of David's counselors who lived in Gilo. Soon many others also joined Absalom, and the conspiracy gained momentum. Leave it up, please. You see this? Absalom is the son of King David. He's conspiring behind his father's back, we learned last week, because he thought his daddy should have dealt with his half-brother for raping his sister. Absalom should have been killed, the law says, but David had mercy on him. Let him come back and look what he does. He conspires. Not only does he conspire, but he gets the chief counselor of David. Let me tell you what the Ahipophel spirit does. It always finds a leader that has an Absalom spirit on them. Any leader that says, I can do it better than the leader in here, I'm going to build me a team to secretly conspire against it, a hippo fella come in the room. Another offended person. Another wounded person. They basically create their own wound licking group. Y'all understand, we've been there. All of us have been there. I've been there. I've been in the car rides after lunch talking about the pastor, conspiring. And I'm ashamed of it. That's God's appointed man. I was conspiring against the King of Kings because I was wounded, because I had an offense in my heart and I was bitter. And you know who I was in the car with? I was in the car with the person who I thought could replace him and get the church in the next place. An Absalom spirit. There'll always be a ringleader. Always be a ringleader. I want you to know something. It's important that you understand something. Wounded people wound people. Wounded people wound people. And you know what happens when you're wounded? You leak. And I'm telling you this, I've experienced it in other churches and I've experienced it in this house. When you're wounded, you can't hide it and you think you can. You know how we know? Because when you walk by us, you're leaking. You're leaking. You can see the bitterness and offense all over you. And let me tell you what happens. Unfortunately, you leak on some other people and it contaminates them too. And you find yourself conspiring and plotting against God's authority. 
because of an offense, because you're not reading your words and getting it in you, and you're unclean, and you've got waste on the inside of you. You know, demons only can come, they just can't overpower people. They have to be invited in. You, you know that? They have to be invited in. You know what kind of, you know, when everybody buys their house or gets a house, you decorate it how you want it, right? You know, demons do the same thing. You know what they like to live in? Crap. Bitterness. Anger. Resentment. Unforgiveness. Now you got good curb appeal. You look good from the outside. Oh, I go to church every Sunday. You know, I serve the pastor great. Oh, I'm doing these ministry. But once I come in the house, it looks like an episode of Hoarders. And you just can smell it. And you leak it on people. Trying to wolf proof this house. And they plotted and they conspired against the leader. And you want, let me just say this right here. I want to really uh, show you something because I'm going to be very vulnerable with you in just a minute. The Ahipophel spirit has no grace for the leader. Yeah, what David did was wrong. He tried to cover it up and he killed his best friend in the process. And he defiled a woman. And Ahipophel was angry. But he does not have the right to take vengeance. And he extended no grace to the leader. Can I say something to you? Come here, babe. Why don't you stand up? Come right here. Come here. I'm going to your sexy self. Yeah. That's all right. I can say that. Uh, but nobody else can. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this to you. This may be a surprise to you. But we're people too. We're going to get it wrong. Unfortunately, more than we want to. All I ask is when I fall, don't bury me. Have mercy with me. Come right beside me and pick me up and say, Pastor, we're with you still. We're people too. And we should be extended grace as well. I want you to know, yes, I will have a different conversation with the Lord one day because I am the leader. I will be judged differently because I am the leader. But His grace is for me too. So I just want to really encourage you. If I say something that offends you, if I do something that hurt you or wounded you, can I tell you from the bottom of my heart, it was not intentional. And please have grace with me. And just tell me. And I'll make it right with you. I'll repent. I'll do what I got to do. Because I'm not above anything. But a Ahipophel spirit, they don't have no grace for the leader. They're offended and they're wounded. And now vengeance is coming. And you know what? They're not alone. They got somebody with them. Who else they can say, well, this can be my leader now. I'm with Absalom. I want you to know something. That betrayal is absolutely a death blow to a leader. You want to know what destroys me and my wife? Not that people have left the church. Not that, you know, whatever. Let me tell you, let me, let, let me hear me clearly. I'm being as vulnerable as I can with you right now. Let me tell you what destroys me. 
is when me and my wife pray for you every day. We welcome you in our house. You eat at our table. And then you conspire behind my back and stab me. It absolutely about destroyed me. And it is a demon and it is meant to destroy this house. And I have feelings and emotions. And I'm gonna tell you here, I know I'm a big, I look strong. It's absolutely about to kill me. And you know what's crazy about it? Some of it's my fault. You know it was David's fault. David should have dealt with Absalom. David should have dealt with Ahipophel. But you just keep letting it go and turning a blind eye and saying God will deal with it, God will work it out, it'll be whatever, we love the person, whatever. Let me tell you something. In your families, you cannot tolerate a demon. We're not talking about people. Hear me clearly, I'm not talking about nobody. I'm talking about a spirit. You don't tolerate those things. And that's something I had to learn the hard way. So we don't tolerate this anymore. This house must be wolf proof. You see somebody uh, conspiring behind doors or whatever, go get right in the middle of it and say, what y'all talking about? That's what you do. Shut it down. There'll be no conspiring against the greatness of his kingdom in this house. I want you to read with me 2 Samuel 15, 30 and 31 because here's what's going to happen. Let me show you. Look at the betrayal that David has experienced. He's just found out this, that his son's trying to kill him and he's found out that Ahipophel has joined his son. Look at the pain in this. David walked up the road to the Mount of Olives weeping, weeping. as he went. His head was covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning. And the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the hill. When someone told David that his advisor Ahithophel was now backing Absalom, David prayed, O oh Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. Okay, we're going to stay right there for a second because I want to give you some revelation the Lord give me. Number one, I have witnessed this myself personally. I've seen this verse come alive. Here's what I've seen. I've seen no matter how many times somebody betrays you, and this can go across the board in your family, in your relationships, whatever, you don't know who's for you until an enemy shows up. And look at here, David in his most vulnerable place, and it says the people who were with him covered their heads and wept with him. I want you to know that God has called people to you. You're not going to be alone. No matter how you feel, you feel like I'm all in alone. No, there's somebody there that'll get in a hole with you. They'll wrap their arm around you and say, it's going to be all right. But I want you to see something very powerful here. David, the king who God established and God's authority is on him. Look what he does. He did what? Prayed. Oh, Lord, let Ahipophel give Absalom foolish advice. Look what happened. Let me tell you something. Please hear your pastor clearly. If you seek vengeance against one of God's appointed people, look what happens. 2 Samuel 17, 14. Then Absalom and all the men of Israel said, Hushai's advice is better than Ahithophel's, for the Lord had determined to defeat the council of Ahithophel 
which really was the better plan so that he could bring disaster on Absalom. Ah, let me break this down to you. Leave it there, please, because this is very powerful. Right after that verse we read before where he prayed, oh, let a hip fell. Counsel be foolish. God downloaded a plan and told David what to do. Can I tell you something? I have experienced this. I don't know how. It's just divine. I have had traps set for me before and didn't even know they were traps. And the Lord says, when you get here, do this. Gave me as the leader a plan only because they come against God's authority. And he answered the prayer. And this is what he did. He told him, I don't know how to say the guy's name, Hushnai was another counselor of David. And David told him, here's what the Lord says. Go to Absalom and say you're for him. But secretly, I want you to turn Ahipophel's counsel against Absalom. And that's what he done. But here's what's so powerful. I want you to see. For the Lord had determined to defeat the counsel of Ahipophel. Who? The Lord. Let me tell you this. Please hear wisdom today. If you feel like you want to seek judgment against God's authority, whether it's your husband, your boss, a city official, any authority, God himself will fight against you. You need to know that. You need to know that the Lord will determine to defeat you. I can pull up several verses to back this up more. Why? Because you're coming against him now. So you got to fight with him. Has anybody ever defeated our Lord? No. Will anybody ever? No. So it leads me to my third point. Who destroys the Ahipophel spirit? God defeats the Ahipophel spirit, not us. So I want you to know that if you find yourself in a room conspiring and giving wise, supposedly wise counsel against one of God's authorities, he himself will come fight against you. He'll do it. I know it for a fact because I've experienced the judgment of the Lord in this area. I told you I've been in a car with somebody else conspiring against the pastor and thought I was right, y'all. Thought I was right. Had a good heart about it. Cared about my pastor. Loved him, but he needed some help. So we're gonna have a meeting about it. And you know what happened? The Lord got every one of us. Sure did, got every one of us. 2 Samuel, look what happens to Ahipophel when God fights against you. 2 Samuel 17, 23. Look. When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey, went to his hometown, set his affairs in order, and hanged himself. He died there and was buried in the family tomb. God drove him insane. Do not experience a hanging in the spirit do not experience it please turn from it get rid of bitterness anger resentment get God's word inside you we must not seek vengeance on God's appointed authority or he will fight against us and my last point is this and here's what I want to talk about get a shovel Now, why on earth, Pastor, are you saying get a shovel? Because I want you to know it's not our job to fight against a hip field. God will deal with him. But I want to address with you real quickly how we avoid the Spirit coming upon us. And that is we get a shovel. Now, what on earth do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, I want to show you some things. It's very powerful. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 12 through 14. Watch this. Please watch this. 
You must have a designated area outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. Each of you must have a spade as part of your equipment. Shovel. Whenever you relieve yourself, dig a hole with a spade and cover the excrement. Mm -hmm. The camp must be holy, for the Lord your God moves around in your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies. Look at that. He must not see any shameful thing among you, or he will turn away from you. Wow. Mm. You see that? The Lord's saying, get a shovel, go outside, and take a dump. And then cover it up. That's what he said. Because I want to come and walk in the camp with you. And when I come and walk in the camp with you, what will I do? I'll protect you and I'll fight your enemies for you. But I'm not coming in there if there's a bunch of crap in the room. That's what he's saying. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is if you have not dealt with issues in your life, bitterness, unforgiveness, you got a bunch of waste built up. I'm going to make a statement the Lord gave me. You ready for it? He said, Jason, the bathroom's just important as a living room. Many of us want to come and be all in the living room, but the bathroom's just as important. It's where we release the waste. Look at this right here. Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8. This is going to be prophetic for somebody. When we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord... Our God said to us, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. It is time to break camp and move on. Oh. Go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all the neighboring regions, the Jordan Valley, the hill country, the western foothills, the Negev, and the coastal plain. Go to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon. Here comes this word, great. All the way to the great Euphrates River. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm giving all this land to you. Go in and occupy it, for it is the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to all their descendants. Yes, Lord. That word great right there, it comes right after Euphrates River. Now, we'll just go right by it with the human minds, but I'm trying to tell you there's a spiritual implication here. You know what the word Euphrates means? To break away from, to burst out. He wants his kingdom established in us, his great, and he wants it to break and burst out. Okay, but what did we have to do? The last verse, we got to occupy it. Drive out the enemy. Let me tell you this. Can I tell you something? And hear me, this is from the Lord. He told me to declare this over you. Some of y'all need to get up and leave the mountain. You've been sitting at this place long enough. It's time you go to the land he's promised you. It's time you break out and you spread his territory and his kingdom. But you're going to need a shovel because you're going to have to start digging and letting go of some things. And some of you have been holding on to some things for a long time. You know, many of us think that we got a weapon and it's a sword. And we do have the sword. But we also got to have a shovel. There's a bunch of waste in here. And I'm telling you, you're opening the door for demons to come and live. And some of them are already in. And I hear the Lord saying this. It's time for them to let go. It's time to dig a hole and release the hurt. It's time to dig a hole and just forgive them. It's time. My wife, uh, she watches a movie at least twice a week, and I done about I can't help it. I watch it. The Help. I love that movie. It's a great movie. But unfortunately, I've got to a place where I about can quote it now, and I ain't gonna lie to you. But there's a time in the in the movie towards the end where there's a very hateful woman. And she's always coming against doing hateful things. And this lady looks at her, I'm going to say it this way. 
Would you like to say it, baby? Yes. Go ahead, baby, say it. This is powerful now. I know it's funny, but powerful. Listen. Go on, get. Get off my property before we all get one of them things on our lip. Well, that's not what I was thinking you was going to say, but oh well. That's another line. That's okay. That's all right. Here's what she said. She looked her in her face. She looked her in her face and said this. Aren't you tired, Hilly? Aren't you tired? That's okay, baby. Here's what I want you to know. I'm, I want to say that to you. Some of you in here, aren't you tired? Just let it go. Aren't you tired? Get your shovel out. Dig a hole and release it. You know, I hadn't shared any of this, but I'm going to share this last part. You know, the number seven is associated with it. Greatness. It means fullness, completion. God wants his kingdom to be full and complete. You know what I love about the number seven? There's several things in scripture that are associated with it, but something powerful happens in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12. Can we pull that up, please? Listen, look. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years, in the seventh year, you must set that servant free. Yeah. Can I tell you something? Some of you have sold yourself to Satan in areas. Man, I feel the Lord. The Lord told me to tell you it's the seventh year and it's time that you get set free. And I'm here to tell you right now, the only way you're going to be set free is why this way. And this is my last verse and I'm done. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. And hear the words of the Lord. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you're tired and you want to be free, you feel like you're enslaved, you've got bondage and waste and you need to release it, repent. Repent and you will be free. I want everybody to bow your heads and we're going to walk through deliverance together right now. I don't have to call you up. You don't have to come up here. You're going to happen. Deliverance is going to happen right here in your chair. I want you, everybody, to say this. Lord, examine my heart. Reveal the waste. Okay, now listen to me. When he does, you don't have to do it loud. If you want to, so be it. Just say, Lord, I repent from it. Watch him. He's going to hit everybody in the room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Do it, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just let him minister to you.